new parts library first, and then we'll end off our presentation with a design that I've created that showcases our rack and pinion and rotary indexer. Basically, we're going to start from the top left-hand corner all the way to the right-hand corner here. Um, so this is just a PowerPoint presentation that um, I'm showcasing, but we're mainly going to be working on the machine builder. Um, so let me just switch over to that. Here we go. Um, so here we have gave our parts library a bit of a makeover. Um, now we make it a little more um, intuitive to search for your parts. So you can type a part such as a hinge, enter it, and two possibilities are able to show up and you can just drag and drop it into your design here. Another way you can search for your parts is actually copying and pasting the part number that you may have found on our webpage. Um, so for an example, I want the specific hinge. I just click that and drop and place in our model as well. Hopefully this makes uh, searching for your parts a lot easier. Um, it makes it a little more organized. Um, right below we have our new organization of the categories for our invention parts. Um, we believe this way you can locate exactly what you need um, much quicker. Um, so below here, we also have our partners and my parts and uh, public parts. And the use of these parts is um, we have, uh, we're continuing to build our partnerships with multiple um, companies. And here we would just like to display and showcase some of their models. For example, we have our universal robots as well as Yaskawa models. Um, this page will continuously uh, grow. So parts that would be compatible with this would mainly be the robot mounting plates. Um, so here, let's go click on a um, plate here. Um, I'll show you how you can connect the robot to the plate. So here, you just click the model um, and you have this option to create a connector. Click the outside diameter or circumference of the um, base of the robot and click it and just drag and drop onto your model like that. And this allows you to create um, the two parts to be connected together. Um, afterwards, you can connect that to an extrusion or um, the base of your structure. And this would be dependent on the way we have our um, have our um, camera oriented as well. So after you get to the right position, you can also uh, modify your robot. And basically you can move it based on the joints and its degree of freedom. Um, the reason we added this is because of a lot of, a lot of our users have asked us how, um, if, how our structure is able to uh, reach all the way um, for the robot's arm reach. So this allows you to simulate um, the actual application that you have. Um, another addition that we have for the UR model is that we can actually attach the end effector to the end of the arm. So similar to what we did at the base of the robot, we can create another connector and attach it right here and snap it on. So if you notice, um, when you're creating a connector, it will snap onto the plane that you have selected. So if I go to this circle, it will be on this plane. If I go to the bottom one, it will be on another plane. Um, so that would just be another trick that we have. Um, right next to um, the partners page, we have my parts. And what this is, is that we allow you to import all your own files into the machine builder. Um, say we don't have it available on our library yet, we can um, import it and showcase it in the machine builder. So these are some of the supported files that we could introduce into the machine builder. Um, afterwards, after you've imported it, it'll show up on this page and you can reuse it in any of your other designs. Um, right next to it would be our public um, parts. And basically, we are always adding new parts. So if you guys have any suggestions on what you want us to include, please feel free to. Um, we have our mascot, Gary. 
here. Um, basically, he's used as a um, model as a height reference. Sometimes you would like to build your enclosure to eye level or waist height, and this just makes it a lot easier for you to simulate what the operator would actually be working with. Um, so let's just delete that. Um, I'm just going to move on to um, some of our design tools. Uh, these are two new features that we've added. Um, so first we have the manual constraint and the connection checker. So how that works is um, if you guys are familiar with other cla uh, CAD platforms such as SOLIDWORKS, um, you would have this mating feature. And a lot of our users have actually requested that we add this functionality into our web page. So without further ado, let me showcase how that works. So say I have this plate, it has six different connectors. And basically I can see the connectors and um, the white dot would enlarge when I've selected it. So I just click on one and I want to constrain it to a specific point in my structure. So I just click that and you'll see that I have a couple of degrees of freedom that I could rotate it to, but it's always gonna be constrained to that exact point. Um, this makes it a lot easier uh, for us to optimize on our design time. Um, right next to it, we have our connection checker. Um, so for an example, if I were to um, detach these parts and I move this around, I'll see that this part was not connected. Um, a way that would be easy for me to check that all of my parts are actually connected is just clicking it. And now we can actually see that everything is connected. So basically that would be a good check at the end of your design, um, just to make sure that everything is properly connected and there's no floating parts within your assembly. Um, right in the middle here, um, we can toggle between using imperial or metric um, measurements. So um, if you're used to imperial units, uh, you'll see that the extrusion lengths here actually change to imperial. Um, and if you use the measurement tool, which I'll later demonstrate, this will be an imperial value. And if you switch over, it'll be metric. Um, here, these are increments um, that we could utilize in our design. Um, typically, we recommend always sticking with the 45 uh, millimeter increment. And the reason for that is just it makes design quicker. Um, the machine builder doesn't have to calculate all the different possibilities of the snap-on. Um, but if you do have a specific position you would like to locate um, a part to, you can change the increments and you can slide it on different degrees of freedom and you'll see that they increase by one millimeter. So this would be a helpful tool if you have a specific location that you need to point a part to. Here we have our different visual styles. Here we can work with a wireframe like that. Um, typically we use the shaded. Um, here, uh, these would be our assembly tools. And this would be a tree view. And you can actually see the different parts um, associated uh, in your design. And if you click it, um, the part would actually highlight within uh, the part. And you can also see that there would be associated fasteners with it. Uh, so this is a really helpful tool during assembly just to see um, how the parts are connected to each other and where you can locate the parts. Um, a lot of our users have asked us what the group and ungroup feature is for. And if I select these parts and I group it, I can actually see it in the tree view at the very bottom right here and right here. And I can expand it to see what is actually connected with it. So the purpose of our grouping function is not really to create a connector. Um, as I've demonstrated before, um, connectors are supposed to be automatically generated as you snap on parts with each other. Um, the grouping function is mostly for you to organize your assembly. Say you have a very large and complex assembly and you would like to distinguish different sub-assemblies within it. Um, it just helps you sort out your parts like that. Uh, next, we have our explode feature. Um, so this just allows you to 
see the different parts that you have within your assembly, um, also useful for um, assembly tips. Um, here, uh, Michael has actually uh, presented a blog showcasing the different kinds of measurements, um, but I'll give you guys a walkthrough um, based on a few demonstrations. So if you're actually used to our CAD platform, you're going to be used to the face-to-face -to -face measurement tool. So each face that you select has to be parallel to each other. So here, this would be helpful for overall dimensions um, or specific dimensions that you'll need. Um, our edge tool is used to select for a single part with a continuous line. So this does, it's just simplifies it so you don't need to select two faces. I can just measure this extrusion by selecting a continuous line. Um, next, we have our point to point. And basically that's kind of similar to the face, the face to face measurement, but I can actually take the shortest distance within two points. So here I can get the diagonal value of um, this point all the way over to this point. So um, that would be a helpful tool if your faces are not exactly parallel to each other, but you would still like the measurement. Um, right over here, we have our different settings. Um, something that I would like to recommend is to turn off the autosave. Um, I think a lot of our users um, have this feature on and it saves over um, the design, even for versions that you might not need. Um, however, if you're worried about losing any of your progress, please feel free to turn it on. Um, here we have visual styles that we could um, change to. So you can, if you're making your thumbnail or if you want to show shadows, you could um, change that visual display. Um, here, this is a very helpful tool if you are building an enclosure with a lot of panels, but you would like to work within the enclosure. So say I had my panels, but I was missing a gusset or I was missing a connection. I don't wanna rotate my um, model everywhere just to get that snap on. So I can actually just remove the panels and insert the part that I need right in there. Um, this is also another helpful tool that um, I would like to mention. Um, if you're using our hinges, um, there are different snap increments that you could rotate your parts to. Um, so if you have a more precise degree, um, you can uh, snap it to five degree or none at all. And that will allow you to play with the degrees a little more. Um, up top here, if you're new to our platform, um, I would highly recommend taking a look at our different shortcuts in the machine builder. Um, some of my favorites would be R and F. So here, if I actually go down here, R resets the camera to the origin. So say I'm lost in the machine builder space and I can't really locate my uh, design, I just click R and then F just to fit to the page. If I have a highlighted part specifically, it will um, give me an isometric view specifically to that part. Um, other cool shortcuts that we have is we have very intuitive shortcuts such as the copy and paste. So if I click Control C and click Control V, it will copy and paste the parts that I have highlighted. Um, above that, we have a request for design help tool. So this actually links you to one of the application engineers and we'll be able to review your design. So just let us know what kind of help that you'll need. Um, give us as much detail as you can under the scope, um, such as helping me verify that I have all the connectors. Um, could, you make me, uh, could you make sure that I have everything under a space constraint? Is it strong enough? Is it rigid enough? Um, and tell us a little bit of your application. Afterwards, we'll mainly contact you by email and we'll let you know when it's ready uh, for us to review together. We really love working with our clients and just um, making sure that your project comes true. Um, so above that, I would like to showcase um, the different um, tools that we have. So here we have uh, the price that's gonna be displayed in real time. So if I just click and drop a part, the price will change accordingly. Um, above that would be the weight of the system as well. And once you're ready, you can either click checkout or download a PDF quote. 
Um, so hopefully this gives you a good overview of what our machine builder has. Let's jump into the linear actuator selector. Um, so we have three different available types of linear actuators right now, and they are as follows. We have our belt actuator, our rack and pinion, and our ball screw actuator. So sometimes it might be a little overwhelming to see how you can choose the um, linear actuator that could help you optimize on cost, uh, use for the proper repeatability, the speeds and the load capacities that you'll need for your application. So we're mainly going to be chatting about the rack and pinion today. So let's review that. Here, um, I'm showing you a flowchart of how to select your linear actuator. You can actually find this flowchart under our tech docs. Um, so they're mainly broken down into four categories. We have our travel, load, speed, and precision. Um, so let's do a really quick exercise to see how we can end up to the rack and pinion and um, what design choices we need to consider. So beginning with the first part of the flowchart, our category is travel. So the beauty of the rack and pinion is its travel capabilities. Um, and they're really only limited to the length of the cable that you have. Um, they come in two lengths, the 540 millimeters and the 810 millimeters. Um, and they're completely modular. So what you'll need um, to adjust the length is just add on a double extrusion and attach it to the racks. Um, since travel is only um, limited to your cable length, you can select it less than 1,350 millimeters or greater than 1,350 millimeters. Um, so our second category would be for load. Um, so right now, our uh, rack and pinion falls right in between uh, the belt actuator and the ball screw actuator. Um, our lightest duty would be the belt and our heavy duty would be the ball screw. Um, please keep in mind that the rack and pinion could have a maximum linear capacity up to 1,000 newtons, and you can achieve those load capacities by using a 5 to 1 gearbox and it will just increase the reduction. Next, we have our speed. Um, so the rack and pinion can handle speeds um, greater than 500 millimeters per second at, or less than 500 millimeters per second. So what it really comes down to would be for the precision. Um, so the rack and pinion has a higher precision than the belt actuator and a lower precision than the ball screw actuator. But also depending on the linear guidance that you'll be utilizing, you could achieve precision uh, less than 0.05 millimeters if you select the linear guide rails and its bearings. Um, so hopefully we are able to clear this up uh, in terms of selecting the rack and pinion. Um, I love to show you a demonstration of a model um, that we have. So here we have a range extender for um, our universal robots. And because the travel length is um, greater than 1,350, um, we believe that selecting a rack and pinion would be ideal. And you'll see it here that the racks fit nicely inside our extrusions and you can continue to build on your assembly. Um, so a great thing about the rack and pinion too would be its minimal maintenance um, requirements. So you just have to oil the racks um, probably once a year and it's very dependent on your cycle times as well. So here we're going to be looking into the profile selection. So a frequently asked question from our users is, is my structure strong enough? So to me, it could mean two different things to me. What kind of deflection would be tolerable in your application? Um, for this question, I would also have a follow-up question is, what is the payload on your structure? The second point that I would think would be, are you looking for a structure that is rigid enough that won't experience vibration? So these would be the two categories. So after these two things, I consider um, even if the extrusion could handle the load capacity that you'll need, that you'll be placing on the structure, I'll ask, is it gonna be well braced enough? Is it anchored to the floor? If you enlarge the footprint of your structure, that would also make it more stable, um, but you can shorten uh, and decrease your footprint if it was anchored to the floor as well. Um, so it's very dependent on the application. 
And another frequently asked questions from our users is, are we able to perform an FEA analysis? Um, this would give you a very detailed analysis of your structure. Uh, we do have quick workarounds to see which profiles work best for your applications. Um, so I'll be giving you an example afterwards based on different uh, loads and how um, they would deflect. So I'll give you some examples now based on the four different types of profiles, what they're typically used for. Hopefully this gives you a better guideline of selecting your uh, profile. So for our light duty extrusions, we use these extrusions for non-load bearing applications. So we use them for guarding or fencing. Um, for our 45 by 45 millimeter extrusions, we will use them for applications where the structure does not require to be super rigid. Um, but this will also be dependent on how well you brace the structure. Um, but we typically use the 45 by 45 for bracing as well. Um, for our double extrusions, we will use them for application where rigidity is a requirement. Um, these are typically used for the feet of the structure or our linear actuators. Um, you can use them in two different orientation. Of course, using them vertically this way with the load coming down here, this would make it much more rigid than if you were to put a load on the side in a horizontal plane. So um, for our heavy duty extrusions right here, our 90s by 90s, uh, we use them for heavy, um, for very high load capacities, um, and as well as for structures that need to be very well braced and rigid. So we, similar to the double extrusions, we will use them for inspection jigs, uh, linear actuators, or just heavy payloads. Um, so hopefully this gives you a clearer image um, of our different uh, profile selectors. A quick um, exercise to see how you would be able to um, go for a beam calculation. Um, so the example that I have, I'm using the, um, using the equation up top here. And basically, I would like to specify that I only have a max deflection of three millimeters for a length of 1,530 millimeters. Um, so based on that, let's see what kind of loads we are able to handle. So for the first one, our light duty uh, under the three millimeter deflection, it would be 10 kilograms. And then it's 175 kilograms. And then for our double extrusions, it's 1,250 kilograms. And for our heavy duty extrusions, it would be um, 2,080 kilograms. So you'll see that there's quite a bit of a wide range for the load capacities on each of these extrusions. Something to keep in mind of, this is only for a single extrusion. So if you have more extrusions um, that will be connected to each other, that will also change on the load capacity. Um, so for the rack and pinion, uh, let's go into that. Uh, this is the configuration of a rack and pinion, and I love to showcase how this would be assembled together using a double extrusion. We can just drag and drop it into the machine builder and select the length that you would like. Um, we would go back to our linear motion and drop in the racks right inside the V slots of our extrusions. Afterwards, we would slide it to the position that you'll need it. Um, here we have our pinion housing that will be connected to the rack. And if you actually orient it this way, you'll actually see the pinion uh, riding on the racks. Um, afterwards, you'll need to have these end stops. And basically, these act as two different things. Um, we could use these as a sensor holder. And typically for our sensors, we would use our inductive uh, uh, proximity switches. And basically this will detect the edge of your pinion housing. And this will act as a homing and an end stop sensor. The second purpose of having these end stops is it actually locks in your rack inside the V-slot of your extrusion. So it secures it into place. So these are necessary uh, for your configuration of the rack and pinion. Uh, next, we would drop in the, um, the stepper motor. And another way we could have increased the load capacity would be to drop in a gearbox to the pinion housing, and this will create a bigger reduction. 
and this would be a configuration with the gearbox. Lastly, what we need to add would be a guidance system. So for all linear actuators, you definitely need a guidance system. So here, I, we have two different available options for the linear guidance. For um, higher loads and higher precision, we would definitely recommend using the guide rails with our linear, guide, our linear bearings. And basically, I'm toggling through the different um, the rotations using my left and right arrow key, and that allows me to snap it on to the right orientation. Um, another linear guidance that we could utilize would be our rollers, and you can snap them on using eccentric and cocentric. So basically, the eccentric rollers gives you that adjustability while you're assembling your assembly, you would assemble them last. Um, so here I have my eccentric roller, and then on the other side, if I was using the uh, rollers as a guidance system, I would have the cocentric rollers on the other side. But just um, sticking with this, we could keep the linear guidance on the other side as well and attach the bearings there. So now we're complete with um, configuring the rack and pinion. Um, afterwards, you, we also have um, the machine logic that would be able to be compatible with the rack and pinion and you can simulate the movement. So we'll be going on to our rotary indexer. Um, so it's super exciting to have an actual rotating part um, that's going to be automated in, on our platform now. So it gives you that extra degree of freedom that you'll need. And you can use these for inspection jigs, R&D applications, manufacturing, assembly. It's really, there's a lot, there's a lot you could do with them. Um, so here, let's go into the machine builder and see what we could, um, how we can configure it. Let's drop in our rotary indexer onto the page here. Um, and just to let you know, it has a default reduction of 4.24 to 1. Um, you can add on a gearbox if you need greater torque. Um, so just setting up the rack, I'm just going to switch it back to my 45 um, millimeter increment, snap it on, slide it, same thing on the other side. And right now I'm just creating a simple rotary table and we do have a more um, elegant design afterwards uh, that I would like to showcase to you. It's going to be available on the public library of our designs. However, I would just like to show you how simple it is to actually make a, um, a rotary table. Here, I'm just creating the base. And then here are my legs. Right now, I'm not um, adding any connectors in. And the reason for that is we always recommend starting with the base of your structure and then adding in the connectors last um, just to see what your overall design would look like. Um, here, what you'll need to add would be a um, stepper motor. Um, so we have three selections of the stepper motors, um, but let's go with the largest one. Um, so it's configured there. And then you can place a tooling plate or um, create a structure of your own on top as well. And basically, it's going to be able to rotate 360. Um, so what you'll need for this would be a structure, a stepper motor, um, a machine motion controller, as well as a homing sensor. Um, so depending on where you're going to um, locate your part, it just, in, it just sets the uh, position at zero wherever you need it to be. So here you can create a simple platform as well on top of, um, on top of the indexer. So this will be the moving component. and you can rotate it like that. And I believe it will be very shortly that we will be releasing this onto our machine logic. So you'll be able to program this as well. And now let's go to your mega construction <laughs> that has both the rack and pinion and the indexer included. As Michael was saying, um, I've integrated a rack and pinion here, right over here. Um, here I have a ball screw actuator. Here I have a rotary um, conveyor table, um, and I love to showcase what this application could be used for. 
um, here I've simulated in machine logic um, and you can tune into um, our third webinar which Mac has presented previously to get a little more detail on how to simulate machine logic. Um, so here I'm homing the system and this allows the operator to place a part in there. Um, I'm going to give him five seconds to do that. Afterwards, um, it's going to position the part into a 400 millimeter position where the weld head will be automated and weld onto the part here that's going to be set on our table. And basically how the part will be set is we're actually going to be using pneumatic cylinders to set the part into position. And it's going to be uh, set onto this rest pad right here to uh, lock it in place. Afterwards, you can continue welding your part as it, um, as it gets pushed onto the free rolling conveyor rollers. Um, and afterwards, it's going to push it all the way to these automated conveyor rollers, um, which um, gives you access to this rotary table where you can now turn it and display your part onto a automated um, conveyor or another um, autonomous robot that will carry the part to a different section of your facility. Um, so that would be the main use of this material positioner. So this could be used as a welding application or you can even put a miter uh, blade here for you to cut your parts and set it into position. Um, but yeah, um, this is the material pusher. Um, it's very interesting. <laughs> great. Um, is there any questions regarding this application? Uh, this not regarding this application, but we okay. do have a question from Rex, mm -hmm. and he's asking us, what kind of controllers do we use, and what is the program language? Oh, that is a great question. Um, so basically, we're using this machine motion controller, and what I just showed you is our machine logic. Um, basically, that is a program that we simulate within the CAD, and you it's basically a plug and play. You download this script and whatever you see in the machine logic will actually be the same thing in real time. Um, so you just download that onto the machine motion controller and that would be um, how the script would work. Another very powerful tool for more complex programming applications, you could use Python and the, pro uh, the protocol used would be TCPIP. Um, and you can program using that as well. Does that answer your question? Waiting to hear back from Rex on that one, but I do believe so. And uh, we'll get back to him if not. Um, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Anonymous attendee. Would it be possible to have the links to the design showcase? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so afterwards, uh, Michael could post the links to the designs that were showcased um, and you can access it there. Perfect. I will do that. Amazing. And uh, now we're going to be going into our new our Q&A session. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be wrapping up this with a open Q&A session for anything else that you have um, noted during the presentation or that you'd like to know more about Vention or the machine builder. So we received a question mm -hmm. and it is how much does the material pressure cost? Um, you can see the price of it in live time right here. So right now, um, this uh, this assembly would be 26,000 approximately. And this uh, includes all the controls aspect of it as well. The only part that's not included would be the weld head. Um, that's something that we could integrate into um, your material pusher. Um, I believe in the market it is well compared. Um, however, we can definitely work within your budget um, and we can customize it to any lengths um, that you'll need it to be at. I don't think so. Thank you so much, Vivian, for yeah. your well-informed 
webinar. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. It has been a pleasure. And as always, we're gonna be uploading this webinar video to YouTube as well as on our social channels so that you can continue to review the tips that were shared today. Um, I will also be sharing the public design links to any of the machines that were featured in this session. And we hope that you join us for our next Design Tips webinar. See you soon, guys. Thank, Thank you so you. much.